Hello, welcome to our case study presentation. Um, it is about building multilingual and multi-domain Drupal websites, and uh, we will present the case study of Sonova together with the client, which is here. Uh, maybe, first of all, a question. Who has already built a multilingual website in Drupal 7? Oh, yay. <laughs> Lots of experts in the room. That's great. And who has built a multi-domain website like with different content in different domains? All right. Okay. So we all got, went through the same thing. That's, that's great. So I hope also to have some exciting discussions afterwards. I think everyone has his best practices, and this is our goal today. We will share our best practices. So, yeah, this is what we present today. First of all, who we are, then how we met with Sonova, and then shortly uh, talk about the technical setup. Afterwards, we will dive deep into domains and languages, translations. Then we will talk about the limitations uh, you should know if you build a, a site like that, and then talk about the methodology, how we work together, and conclude the topic. So, yeah, first of all, who are we? Um, my name is Dag Mahmoud. I'm a lead project uh, at Amazing Labs, and uh, my Twitter handle is Dag Mita, and I was uh, yeah, leading the project from the beginning on. And um, here with me is our client from Sonova. Nico. Hi, my name is Nicholas, and I'm corporate brand manager at Sonova. Now, this introduction will probably raise more questions than it, it, it answers, because what is the corporate branding manager doing here? Um, when it's about web and Drupal and what is Sonova. But more about that, more about that on talking about how we met. Who is Sonova? Sonova is the leading hearing healthcare provider in the world um, with different brands on the market. The most well known is in the hearing aid segment and is Phonak. But we also have different brand Unitron and also for cochlear implants for people who really don't hear well. Um, we have AB, and are also present in the retail market where we sell hearing aids directly to customers. Now, everything, just a side note, all the companies basically, they try to get people to hear better. For me, personally, it's really important because um, I have severe hearing loss, so without those tools, I couldn't be here today, and I enjoy, enjoy being here today with you. Um, but altogether, Sonova has sales of approximately 2 billion, uh, more than 9,500 employees worldwide, and present in more than 90 countries. Now, the brands you have seen have mostly been acquired, um, in gross, they've been added to the company, so it's uh, more of a conglomerate at this point still. Um, and there's more and more centralized functions coming into being. And also, among the employees, we want to create this shared um, the shared vision of what we actually all do and it doesn't matter which brand one works on and this is the decision that was made approximately two years ago um, when management said we need a corporate brand to come to life and this is basically also the first project milestone because that's where I as a brand manager came into the game because the first thing I would do, I would look at the website, which is the main touch point um, from a branding perspective, most visitors, etc. And to be honest, Sonova was just an investor brand. It didn't really look good. So the impression one got was not that nice. So in the end, it was more from, a, that's why we did it from branding, is um, because we started the project, we said we needed new and better. So. We contacted um, Amazi early in 2013 and had the project kick off end of February. Um, and the idea was to, in the first phase, to um, have to set up new, kind of from a visual perspective, from a technical perspective. But lots of content actually was just migrated. Um, but what we had as a from a, from regulatory for regulatory reasons at the stock market. We needed to integrate also very delicate um, third-party systems um, with automated live publishing um, because if something goes wrong there, you can have penalties um, that cost millions. So it was a very short time frame to get all this done 
until May 21st, because May 21st, and Sonova still is a, uh, um, an investor brand, is one of the most important uh, days for investors. It's the publication of the full year results. And it was tough. It cost some weekends on my side and um, Macy's side as well uh, to get it done, but um, we we're happy, really happy to, to have it in place until then. It was a huge milestone. Um, later on this year, we are looking at the international rollout of the brand. So Brazil came up as one of the first markets where we want to um, also foster this Nova spirit. And um, there we, of course, need a different language, different domains. So for me, as a brand manager, as a web manager, this is how the site looks. It um, looks great, I think. <laughs> But anyway, it helps transport those values that we want to stand for. It helps get the message across um, that we like to. And Dagmar is going to tell you a little bit more yeah. technically. Yeah, so as you see here, the site is fully responsive. Um, it is um, built with Drupal 7 and the Omega 4 theme. Um, we use SaaS and Compass from scratch. We don't like to use tools like Bootstrap because they don't allow us to be really flexible in the design we provide. We would like to be flexible in the grid we use, etc. Um, yeah, then we are using uh, Fuse in combinations with panels, panels everywhere, and panelizer. This also out of flexibility, flexibility reasons. If we panelize nodes, we are able to add blocks on, on those and have a little bit more of a flexible, we can show flexibly different types of content on pages. Um, yeah, then there's also a search on this site where we use Apache Solar as a search server. And as Nico already said, there are uh, lots of third-party integrations, and we have integrated them via either via XML or via iframe. And the companies we have integrated uh, with as uh, investors and Tensit, some of you might use it if you're from a stock-listed company. And we have to be really reliable with the website. Um, as Nico already said, it's really important that information is displayed correctly within seconds on the website. So that's, we are, that's why we are hosting uh, at, uh, so, uh, at our hosting partner. We have a server cluster there that is uh, dedicated and, and has a setup for Drupal that we need. And the servers are in Switzerland. That's maybe a special thing also for us. A lot of our clients don't like to to host abroad, they would like to keep their data in Switzerland. I don't know if you know, they have these mountains with where they dig a hole in there and keep the data in there. Like This is still the thinking. I mean, our, host, our servers are not there, but still in Switzerland. Yeah, so this is all about the basics. Now, um, let's dive in, domains and languages. And first of all, Nico will, will tell you what requirements he has. Well, as I already said, we had a project in different phases, also due to time constraints. In the first phase, it was just German, uh, because we're a Swiss company, and English, because we're an international company, of course, um, with one main global domain. Now, as we are rolling out this employer brand worldwide, we are looking at different countries where we need to have the content available. Um, so Brazil is one of the first countries that came up um, with own content in Portuguese. And um, for me, I'm a really lazy guy. So, you know, I came to him to Amazing and said, I need to have a way to, to get a hold on things and have people kind of work in structures where I can allow them only to do certain things and to control actually what kind of content is there out in the world, because in branding it's all about consistency um, of information and of looks. So I want limited rights for country managers and country editors, but also the possibility to, to allow them to do certain stuff so I don't have to. Um, and also what's a requirement for, from my side, from a business perspective, is I want to be able to multiply this thing across countries. Next time something pops up, I want this to work for, for the future. So, Dogmar's going to tell you how they solved. Yes. Okay. It's going to be a big table, and 
you have to have some energy to digest that. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, first of all, as Nico said, um, they, w they wanted to have several domains uh, with uh, different content and uh, different rights. So the first thing you do is you build up domains and you use the domain access module for that. And in the case here, we have set up a global domain, a Brazilian domain, and a Portuguese domain. Uh, if you check on the website, not everything is enabled that we're talking here. So that's not bugs, but it's just not yet implemented. Um, yeah, so what you would like to use is, is subdomains um, because uh, in this case there are still a lot of there's still a lot of overlap in the in the design and also in in the content we display. So you would not want to do have different databases or have a multi-site for for that kind of things. If you would implement a, a multi-site and you would like to change one little thing somewhere overall over your all whole set of, of pages, then you would do the have to do the change on every on every instance. So we have taken over websites from clients as, that were multi-sites and we are now building them back into in, into different domains. Yeah, then as a next step, you would like to have languages, of course. And um, first of all, if you add languages, you might uh, use the domain local tool uh, module because this helps you to solve a lot of cases with domains and languages. For example, redirects. I think that is kind of a no-brainer. Then there's this big topic of languages. In this case, we wanted to have a German and an English for the global domain, and we wanted to have for in Brazil, English as well, and Portuguese as a new language, and then in Portugal, only Portuguese. Yeah, so what we could do is we could just have three languages, right? Um, German, Portuguese, and English. But we, t we decided to split up English and, and have two times, uh, have two different Englishes, <coughs> Englishes, English languages, so one for the global domain and one for the Brazilian domain. Because what you don't want that your Brazilian content editor is editing your global content, you would like them to have different, um, I would say, ecosystems that they have diff that they have rights to only their content and and that they have a their area, and that's why uh, we have two languages. But that would also mean that you would have to translate everything again. Like you have English for global, but you would like to. Uh, add another English and that would mean translating everything again. And uh, you don't have to, that's the good news. You can use the language fallback module. And that works like you use a current language um, that you already have, like in this case it was the global English was already there. And then you add the English and Brazilian and say this English Brazil will fall back on uh, English global. So if you, if you start off without any translations, it shows you everything uh, from the global domain, all the content from the global domain. And, just, and then that means you have to just translate what you would like to have additionally and what you look, would like to have different. And that is really um, a handy solution. So next steps, you would do something like domain variants. What is that? So this has to do with SEO. If you, if you set up um, domains, you have to set up like with points, like sonova.com.br, like real subdomains, uh, or sonova.com.pt. And uh, Google then decides if they handle these subdomains as two different websites or if they combine them. But this is not on your, in, in your control. So what could, what could happen is that Google decides that they separate these two and then your domain authority would split up between these two subdomains and your ranking thus would be lower. So what you would like to do is you would like to keep the control. You would like to bring them under one domain. And this is how, why we have um, came up with a domain variance module. And that allows you to change the URL of the subdomains. So how we change it, if, if we have the Sonova Brazil domain, it's for example uh, sonova.com.br, and we, we change it and say, no, you are now sonova.com slash Brazil slash PTBR or slash Brazil slash ENBR. And then you have one domain and it falls all under this. So next point is menu. Okay, so 
I have already talked a little bit about permissions. And you would like to base your permissions uh, or you would like to create this ecosystem for these people that are working per domains. Most of the time, like there's one person that is responsible for Brazil, one for Portugal, one for global. And you would also have to ha like to have the flexibility to add different workflows depending on the, on the domains. Nico pointed it out. Uh, some affiliates are stronger and have more independence, so they have, they have the possibility to, to edit content more flexibly and others they are more dependent on the headquarters and you don't allow them to do everything. So that's why you want to, to, uh, sh uh, to take this away and in terms of the menus it means that uh, we have created three different menus like one menu um, per domain. So that means we have now a global menu and there are the, there are the two languages uh, German and English in there in Brazil, there are, two, there are the other two languages in, and, and Portugal has, has the other one. So, yeah, and here we have also created a module for that. It's uh, the domain menu added access. Also, sometimes if you, if you have translatable menus, they get really, really long. Like you have uh, in one uh, menu, you have different languages. And if you would have these five languages in your, in your menus, I guess you know it's getting hardly manageable, especially if you have two times the same language. Totally, total chaos. Right, so I have basically already presented that point, so um, maybe I just would like to add about the, the different permissions. So uh, at Snow White was important that the Brazilian country managers can't uh, create their own nodes. They should only be able to edit uh, existing content. And if you have everything uh, nicely separated, you can add a different role for, for the Brazilian country manager. And on the global domain, of course, the other country manager can do everything. So that allows you to, to have different workflows. Then we are almost finished. Um, then your users come to the site and you would like to route them to the correct domain. And there are two ways how users come to the site. The one is they, they type in something at a search engine, and most of the time they would use Google. And, uh, or they go directly to your website by entering sonova.com. So we have created also a module for that. It's a geo redirect module. And here you can say uh, what, uh, from which geo, uh, which geo IP should lead to which, uh, which domain. So for example, you can tell them, Switzerland and Austria should go to the global domain and Brazil and Argentina to the, to the Brazilian domain, etc. cetera. Right. Then, uh, last, um, when you search via Google. So in the Google Webmaster Tools, you can set the Google country target. And uh, this makes the, the user come, like, or that, that tells Google, hey, if people are in this domain, point them to that, uh, or if they come from this country, point them to this domain. So, and this is what you, you do that after the slashes. So slash global will lead to Switzerland, and slash Brazil to Brazilian, slash Brazil with a set to Brazil, and so on. So this is also a nice way to tell Google what to do. And this is all already. <laughs> um, yeah, and now we go on to translations. And as well, Nico had very special requirements. Not sure whether they are so special, but uh, we had them, of course. In the first phase, um, it was only two languages, German and English. And as I said, we migrated most content. So content was at hand. It was mainly copy and paste to get it all in. Now, in the second phase, with um, more and more websites coming up um, internationally, um, we will have an increase in translations from outsourced um, agencies, for example, or also from other people in other countries. In our company, we don't have one translation agency the whole company works with, but it's very diversified how this works. Um, also, we needed a process to, to be able to have other people handle this because languages are not spoken at headquarters, and I cannot ask my friend next to it, you know, can you try to... Um, <coughs> translate this. Um, and again, here from this, I say, hassle before from copying, pasting to, to word <laughs> files, um, 
and not only the, the body text, but to enter different fields in, in, into a word file, etc., and describe it for a translator to really get this um, easier and, and, and uh, to become faster and more efficient um, also for the future. So, Dagmar. Yeah. Okay. So, for translations, of course, we use uh, field translations with entity translation module. Uh, this is the way to go also for, uh, for Drupal 8. And um, yeah, for, for the translation process, we use a translation management tool, a TMGMT. And this helps you to do all the translations within Drupal. You don't have to leave uh, the site. You can, you can stay on Drupal, no copy and pasting from world files. And uh, I think this is a big gain already. So I'll quickly run through the translation process to just give you uh, an insight in, in, the very, in a very standard process. So first of all, I have created a node and it's called Hello Amsterdam. I would like to translate it into Portuguese. And I can do that by checking the box on the left and clicking on request a translation. Maybe I would like to not only send this node to the translation, but um, uh, send over a whole bunch of notes to the translator. And it's better to have that whole bunch into, into one job because I don't want to send his, give him like 10 notifications in his inbox. So that's what you can do with the add to card functionality. You can add different uh, notes into a card and then bundle them together into one job. Yeah, then we are on the next screen and then we can control again if we have set the right languages. We decided we want to translate it from English um, to Portuguese, that's correct. And then we would like to choose who is our translator. And this is the Brazilian translator. And then we're gonna send it out. Now we're gonna put ourselves in the shoes of a translator. And the translator has just gotten a mail. There's a new job. And uh, here we go. Uh, he sees the translations in his uh, inbox. Um, he can only see this screen and, 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 and yeah, these functionalities on this page in Drupal. Uh, he cannot see it or you can uh, uh, configure it that way that they can only translate and not edit other content or delete anything. So there's a pending job. Uh, hello Amsterdam and this is, has to be translated now. So I go on to view and um, see here this interface. Uh, so on the left side is the original language and on the right side you have to paste uh, the new language. Um, yeah, so um, this is what I'm doing now. Uh, what you, and here you see I have now done my translations. They're added. Um, what you have to do is, is you have to copy the HTML tags. Um, yeah, most of the translators are familiar with it. So most of the time it, it works, but it's still a, a potential source of error, of course. Yeah, then I've done all my translations. Then I click Save um, as completed, and now I'm done as a translator. I'm finished, and now we're going to put ourselves back in the shoes of, of, of Nico, for example. And he sees, he gets a mail, and he, he would click um, on the mail and, and, and get to the job, or he sees it in the overview that um, Hello Amsterdam is still there and uh, he can manage it. So um, here you see uh, the job is now, uh, this node is now uh, ready to be reviewed. So it's not yet live. I need, still need to do one more step to review it. And um, yeah, I do my review uh, and you see it here. Uh, it's all in there. It all looks good, so I'm I'm fine. I'm gonna hit um, save as completed, and from this point on, it will be on Drupal. So confirmation, and that's done. So and then you see it's approved and finished. Um, yeah, this is a very this is a very like the simple process on how to do translations, and 80% of our clients are actually are actually uh, fine with this process, but. There are also other cases that you would like to cover. For example, um, if you work with an external translation agency, they don't want to log into each client's uh, Drupal website to do their translations there. 
they have their own systems, they have their vocabularies there, they have uh, synonyms, they have their time tracking or word tracking, etc. So they would like to stay there. This is also possible with, with the TMTMT, and there are two different solutions. Like the one solution is you can create a job and uh, export this job as an XLIF file. And XLIF is kind of an XML format. And uh, this is a standard for all translation agencies. So their systems comply with that standard and it works most of the time. We had little, little minor uh, problems with UTF-8 um, <laughs> letters, etc., cetera, but it's, it is manageable. So then you send this XLIF file over to your agency. They import it into their system. And when they are done, they export it uh, again as XLIF and you integrate it into your site. It can be a bit of a manual way or effort you have to do, of course, exporting, giving it back, importing again, which jobs have I sent, which jobs have I imported. Yeah, it needs a bit of a coordination. So that's why there's an even better solution. The, be the best solution is that um, you connect a translation agency via an API, and then they, the systems talk directly. And via this interface, you receive, you can not only send over jobs, but you get also additional information back from the agency. And this is, for example, um, different price plans. So you send out translations and they say, hey, so how long should it take to give you the translation back? Do you like to have it in six hours or in 48 hours? And depending on that, the price is different. And then you can choose your plan and you already see how much it would cost because they know how much words in, are in this file. And you can manage your cost and say, okay, that's fine for me, go for it. And then after some time or after they have finished, they send it back via Drupal and you go through the same um, uh, review and, and approval process. From our experience, it, it takes around three or four days, I guess, to, to set up such an interface to a Drupal agency. And then they can reuse it for every Drupal site. Yeah, this was it uh, for translations. Now we will talk about limitations and who could do that better than the user. <laughs> the evil customer. Um, now, first of all, it has really helped us to, to become more efficient, the whole setup that we have now. And I believe it to be scalable to a certain point where we are comfortable with it as a company and also to have the speed to be able to do that. Um, just some limitations that I have encountered from a client perspective is um, for me as, a, as the page admin and the overall complexity has become, has increased kind of. Now I have different menus for different countries, um, but that's just something that comes hand in hand and I guess that's just something that also kind of makes sense that will be that way. Um, with regards to usability of TM, TMT, this is something where I'd really like to see further improvement in the future because as you have seen the screenshots, um, the user experience kind of often makes me have to grab the telephone and call the person <coughs> doing it for the first time and explain to them what do they, what do they actually have to do in that step. Now, once they are settled with it, it, it works fine, but it just takes some, some learning to get them to have to. Um, other than that. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Sleep well. Um, Should we? Did someone turn the lights off? Oh, thank you. Anyway, um, some other things that, uh, that, that I would like to see improvement is workflow options with review process. Until now, I can only accept it or reject it, the translation. Once I accept it, it's live on the website. Um, now, for example, if I had Chinese or whatever, I don't speak Chinese. Currently, I do not have the option to send it to a colleague in, in China uh, and, and to have him review it, review it for me. Um, and it would also be nice to be able to see the, the translation in the site layout, in the HTML code, because as Dogmore said, sometimes um, 
you have to copy the HTML tags, etc. And there's just mistakes that happen sometimes, but that's just something you can review at that point. Um, now, one of my favorite topics when talking about limitations is the translation of strings. And I'm sure that uh, my girlfriend found a couple of gray hair lately, and I'm sure that's due to the translation of strings because it's really a nightmare from my point of view I had to get a handle on that. And I still, um, you know, we, we've become better, etc. but I get error messages at some point um, that have not been translated or people finding them because there's just not an overview that I can send everything that I've translated to the translator so that won't happen. But Dogmore, you mentioned something that um, it's yeah. over. Yeah, we have, we have created a, um, a module which is called TMGMT bulk where you can uh, find strings. Uh, you can filter for strings that you haven't translated yet. So I think that will help a lot. We're still testing it, but I have hope this will be better. Definitely looking forward to that. Um, also in that, in the translation of strings, which what makes it hard for me is sometimes for example, I will have to translate the word back. Now, if you don't have a context as a translator, he's either going to say back or back, and when it's entered, it just won't fit the context um, at some, some times. Um, so basically, it has helped us a lot, the implementation of this. Me, I truly believe that for Drupal to become even more attractive for international clients, and I personally believe there's no such thing as local brands, et cetera, in this world anymore. Um, this process would be a huge improvement um, to, to, for clients to be able to handle this. And from my perspective, I'd be happy if anyone in here would contribute to that cause. Are there any, any developers in the room? <laughs> I know there's one. We will grab him. Yay. Yeah. All right. That was all from your side, right? Yeah, yes. from the good. Um, yeah, we now would like to talk about how we work together um, efficiently and good. So I would like to start it off with saying something about the methodology we are using. Uh, at Sonoma, my, most of the projects are uh, done with uh, fixed price <laughs> offers because internally they have uh, a specific budget for uh, a certain time and uh, uh, certain projects. But we can still work in an agile way like that. So if, if, the, if the budget is fixed, uh, you still have two other things that are open, like time and, and scope. And we don't, do we don't do very detailed specifications at the beginning when we estimate. We do very rough specifications, and we try to ask the most important questions. And then we take certain assumptions. And as we have worked together for some time, we kind of know which level of assumptions we should we should guess. And what we, I mean, I always tell um, the analogy of, of building a house. You can build a house and you can put in a carpet or you can put in a very nice wooden floor. It's both a house, but you don't know how, what kind of level of, of comfort your, your client would like to have. And this is where we have our flexibility, carpet or wooden floor. And this is where we take our assumptions. And then within the, the project, we discuss these assumptions. And, and, um, uh, and, and most of the time, we can, we can come to an agreement. Like if the assumption, if our, our cost assumption was too low, we can, we, we, before we implement, we give options. So we say, hey, we thought we would do it like this. And if we do it like this, we would stay in our budget. But if you would like to have it this fancy way, it costs you such and such amount of money more. Which way do you like to have? And I think giving choices is always a very, very good solution. Um, yeah, then another, another thing is that we um, see Nico as a client, as a product owner of his product. And he has also direct contact to developers and designers. We don't want to add absolutely a layer of project management. I take myself out as soon as I can because I have so much projects and uh, it would be not be very efficient. So that's why he has direct contact if this is appropriate. If he doesn't need more consulting, he will talk directly to these people. 
Then another principle we are following our work is, is to be very transparent. Um, our client sees all our project artifacts and systems at any time, like access to the development environment, also access to, to time tracking. He sees at any time how much of the time budget is already used. <coughs> And um, also, we don't create specific documentation for, for different kinds um, of, of stakeholders. Like, we have one specification, and this is for the techies, and this is for the client. And um, yeah, we, we communicate with the same tools. We don't have emails for the client and, and ticketing tool for internally. We all keep it the same so that we work in a very efficient way. And now, Nico will tell us how he feels about it. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> no. Uh, first off, I wouldn't be here if collaboration was not good. It was amazing. And uh, as we've seen, the project milestones that we have reached have been uh, accomplished in, in a good way. And um, yeah, it's just uh, what she was saying about trust as a prerequisite. Um, we, we can be agile and fast if I know that she knows I like wooden floor better than carpets. So when she sends me an offer, she won't send it for the carpet and then I want a wooden floor. So kind of that's just something that grows over time. Um, other things that we've learned in collaboration and that have made our collaboration better is that, uh, well, and the first thing in the project, project manager was changed to Dogmar. And she had a really tough time uh, due to that because I came off out of the project where we had to postpone the launch for several times. Then, you know, you get to know someone, project manager is, um, is changed, et cetera. But it's just a side note. Um, other things is with multiple contacts, which is great. So I don't have to talk to Dogmar. She talks to Mickey and... Uh, you know, she may misunderstand me and he misunderstands her, so it's all more complicated than it has to be. Um, it's easier if we can talk directly. Um, that requires agency internally, uh, great communication, because at times we I would have discussed something <laughs> with Sasha Miki and Dogmar, it happened that she didn't know about it. And it, as a client, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If I talk to someone, I want everyone to be up to speed the next time I call. Um, just to have that going. Um, now, as often, problems strengthen the relationship if uh, they are brought up and are discussed and are also used to become better as one team, so to say, because um, I'd say it's not the classical relationship that I would have with other, with other, um, with other agencies where we have um, Dogmore there, me here, talking to each other, but it's more of a, a, a real collaboration also um, that makes us so so efficient, and uh, that makes me also happy to be here with Amazi today and to talk to you. Um, the shared collaboration tools, from my point of view, in the beginning were a real hassle because you know I like my tools, I, the way I work. So it took some convincing to get me to use them, um, and also on how to use them because in the beginning I would only make one tickets with all the things I would find on the website and Dogmar would be like, what's wrong with you? And now we've handled that. Um, I've become better. So we all have almost no emails uh, and just call and have everything always available to everyone involved in the specific um, project. Or so. Something other just from a, from a project management point of view is um, that we have started to um, to have debriefings after critical project milestones because obviously, as always with technical stuff, it does not always work as you want it at that point. And so we have started to have those debriefings that help us together grow and to improve the processes to um, become even better in the future. So it's been fun with Amazi and with Drupal, and I'm looking forward to where it's going. Thanks a lot. So, one more slide, stop. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Just a little conclusion. Uh, yeah, so building multilingual, multi-domain websites are, is not trivial. Um, 
it needs some thinking. I think also the requirement side is very complicated. It's, it's, it's really the whole process is we have to be mapped out. So, but we think we have, we have done a lot of experiences with it. And I think if you maybe, I hope some of the tips we gave and some of the modules we pointed out can help you to build your website in a, in a good way. Um, yeah, in terms of translations, I think, yeah, the, TMG, the TMGMT works fine. It fulfills the requirement. It can still be improved, and I think we, it will. We have great, a great team behind it, and we have just to keep up also with Drupal 8 that we don't get, like, um, a, a slow down by this. And the third one is, um, as Nico pointed out, to build up trust. Um, uh, building up trust is very important, and to build up trust, it, it requires open and honest communication. Uh, if there's something, uh, like if there's a little fire burning somewhere, if there's a little problem and you don't talk about it, at some point it will come up, and it will come up with three or four problems at the same time, and then there, you have a conflict. So as soon as you feel something is not right, be courageous and uh, uh, talk to the other person and talk to the other person in person or uh, on, the, on the phone and not writing emails back and forth. So this is all. Um, thanks a lot for listening, and now we're open for questions. Are there any questions? Please use a microphone if you have some. Yeah, could you? Yeah, okay, I can repeat it. So how we worked with uh, relationships between content for translations. Relationships in what sense? In both of the sections, there are texts. And if it's the same text, you should also build your site that uh, it takes only, it, it prints only the text once. Like you would maybe have a blog that is in common on these two pages. And then you have, a, you have only one, one blog you have to translate. But I don't know if you mean we can put things together to keep the relation. This is currently not possible. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, my name is Weber, and uh, I'm uh, known on the community as Mark Weber. I'm uh, one of the maintainers of Domain Local, by the way. And I've uh, worked in a product that is very similar to this one. Um, but uh, one thing that you said about the contextual uh, translations. Uh, one thing that you can do at least for in the interface is uh, having your own server for the localizer uh, Drupal.org. You can have your own server and do that uh, contextual translations on the strings. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. a question actually, it's just a suggestion. But one thing that I did not do is that uh, things about uh, getting the countries on the same domain, uh, it's uh, a really good point you got on this product. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Gabor. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, good good session. Um, so I think the the usability of TMGMT is a returning question. Is there anybody else who works with TMGMT and has the same problem? One, two, okay. So it's probably more who are not here. So I think if, I, I don't have the energy, but I think if somebody would like put up a flag and organize a group of people, then we can get, uh, get, get some UX resources involved in making that happen. Because it's certainly a shared problem that I don't think anybody, any company individually would solve. Yeah, but we that's an excellent would, idea. we should be able to solve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still here on Friday. I don't have yet a really specific 
project I'm working on. Thanks for <laughs> taking that on.